Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I love green tape. I normally tell people it's because I can see my pencil lines on the green better than on blue tape. But the real reason is if you map out on the wall where you want a piece of furniture, all you gotta do is Oh, two fingers. I always forget that part. No, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna go out in the shop and show you how I built this. Jerry needs his coffee. Breakfast at Tiffany, she said I think I... And with the pipes properly warmed up, I could get to ripping down the walnut plywood for this project. On the left-hand side, you could see my rendering. So we're gonna start with the bottom cabinet first, ripping down the top and the sides and the bottom. All right, so this is gonna be my top. Waterfall down one side, waterfall down the other, and I'll get the bottom out of this piece. And my trusty track saw makes quick work of cutting these panels down to rough length before I head over to the table saw to put the miters for the waterfall edges and cut them to final length. And I'll be using my trusty L fence to put the miters on these. I just use double-sided tape and a straight edge and put it down on my workpiece and then I can run it past the L fence and get a nice crisp 45 degree miter on those edges. And then with that delicate miter running along the fence I can cut the sides to length since the bottoms have a square butt joint and then I can stack them up just so you can see that I cut them all. Now to join the case I will be using a combination of methods. First here for the miter joints I'll be using the lamello plate joiner which allows these fancy little plastic connectors that clamp together. I also need to drill some access holes which will allow me to access the allen key in these Clamex connectors so I can securely tighten the joint. Now for the aforementioned butt joint connections, I'm using the Domino, and I'm also trying out this new accessory I got called the Domi Plate by Seneca Woodworking. Now I did pay for this, they didn't send it to me. And what it does is it helps to eliminate fence drift. If you own a Domino, then you know it does happen. This eliminates it and you get a nice flush joint all the time. I was pleasantly surprised with it. And then I could do a quick rough assembly and turn my box right side up. Over at the router table with a 45 degree chamfer bit, I could begin making the edge banding for the front of the case. So once I have that profile cut, I could rip off strips over at the table saw and line them up one by four. And then I also needed to rip down some flat edge banding for the raw plywood edges on the back of the case. There you go. Oh, and I actually needed to make a shelf for inside this. So little edge banding, little glue, little clamp, and then I had to domino that because this is going to be a fixed shelf. There's really no reason to do an adjustable shelf in there. I'm never going to move it, so why not make it fixed and really make this carcass nice and strong. I could spread some glue and start assembling the case, which is probably only 24 to 26% as fun as it looks on camera. Now I use one big clamp on the top just to pull those miters together while I tighten those Allen keys of the Clamex connectors and do a limbo to check. Looks good. Oh, and I did check the case for square while gluing it up. I just forgot to film it, so you're just gonna have to believe me. And then I could flip the case over and start to work on the edge banding on the back. These will all be mitered on the four corners, so I can just make my way around all the edges, cutting, clamping, dry fitting, marking, cutting. And one tip while you're cutting small pieces like this is to make a zero clearance sacrificial fence like I have here, prevents any tear out. So as I sequentially marked and cut, I could go around and glue everything in place. I'm using a 23 gauge pin nailer just to pop these in. Again, you'll never see these because it'll be against the wall. So hey, why not use it? Now to glue the beveled edge banding on the front of the case, I had to get a little crafty with some clamping blocks using some CA glue and green tape. What this allows is for nice even clamping pressure down. Otherwise, you only have that small little quarter inch fillet to apply clamping pressure and it wants to skew and twist it. So using these clamping blocks allow nice, even consistent pressure to be spread out over the joint. And I also use some Collins miter clamps, which you can see on the corners there on those little miter joints. Once that was all dry, I could use a block plane to remove the majority of the waste and then finish it up with the random orbital sander. And as usual, I could always count on my man Jerry to inspect my work before moving on to the next step which was to rip down a couple of plywood strips with a 45 degree bevel on one edge, which will be the French cleat that will hang 
this cabinet from the wall. And then it was all about pocket holes. No reason to get fancy here. A couple pocket holes in that French cleat attaches it to the upper part of the cabinet. No problem. Oh boy, look out. Oh, there he goes. Oh yeah, up into the Shopcat loft goes Jerry. Well, that was about all I could handle for one day. So with a good night's sleep, a change of clothes, a shower, I could get back to work. Ripping down some more plywood for the doors. Okay, these door fronts are going to be getting a piece of half inch walnut framed all the way around it. So I wanna size my panels now as close to the final size as I can. So I have two edges flush against two reference surfaces and now I'm gonna take a half inch setup block and make a line all the way around and trim it to that now. I'll do it on both doors and then I can work on the walnut trim. Then using some double-sided tape, I could affix a straight edge on the marks I made and using my L fence, run right down and rip it on those lines perfectly. Peel it off and reveal what's underneath. A little tear out apparently. Then over at the joiner, I could mill up some stock for the edge banding, rip it down to rough width on the table saw before heading back to the planer to mill everything down to the exact same width. And then over at the router table, I put just a little chamfer detail on that trim, as you can see here. Now the reason I did this is because the original design I wanted to do like these doors I did on my home office which is framed and then kind of has those vertical ribs on it. But we'll come back to why that did not work in a minute. Boop. So I just started mitering all the pieces of trim to frame out the door panels. And once I had them cut, I could do a nice dry fit to make sure my miters were nice and tight. That's about as crispy as I can get it. And to get that last piece, I mitered one end and then lined up the ends of the miters and then I could mark where that final cut would be. And then with my zero clearance sacrificial fence completely destroyed, I could still find where that cut line is and line up my pencil line with it, make the cut and proceed with gluing this up. Now I am using a 23 gauge pin nailer on this as well, which I'll go back later and fill those teeny tiny little holes. It's just a lot easier during assembly to do this. And sometimes I'm just a little lazy. Jeez, and now Lola's sticking her little nose in my business. And once the glue was dry, I could proceed with drilling the holes for my cup hinges using my little Craig jig here, which I've waxed poetic about this jig before, and I just love it. It's simple, affordable, and repeatable. Hashtag not an ad. Then I could pop in some hinges just to make sure everything works. And then I could go about drilling the holes and installing the hinge plates. So it was at this point that my wife decided she didn't want the rib doors. Okay, no problem, less work for me. However, that edge banding was really tall to account for those ribs, so I had to rip it all off and just leave basically a quarter inch sticking up. So I did that on the table saw, came up with a nice little frame there. Thanks for the souvenir. And then with a the block plane, I could smooth out any saw marks. Man, I need to sharpen that thing, that's a little rough. And then finish up with a little hand sanding. Just make sure I break all those edges. And then it was back to the table saw to rip down some more plywood for what will be the floating shelf. Well, it's not technically floating since it will have two turn posts under it, but let's not get bogged down with details. Now this will be a miter folded shelf. So I'm cutting all 45s on the table saw as well as on the track saw so that when everything is wrapped together, there's continuous grain on all sides. Well, not continuous, but there's grain showing on all sides and no plywood end grain. And the miters on the narrower pieces, I cut over at the chop saw. And then using some clear packing tape, I could start the assembly before glue. Now I mentioned in my last video, which was on the faux beam mantle, that you can just use clear packing tape and glue. So I'm going to prove that to you here. I'm also proving that I'm kind of a doof because those side pieces should have been taped to the top rather than to the front, which would have made that assembly easier, but oh well, it still works. So with some glue applied, I can fold those miters and then apply some more tape. Now you can use blue tape or green tape to do this, but the clear tape allows you to see through and make sure that your joint is coming together tight. Now, as you can see, my bottom section is a little bit short. Well, that's because I didn't have enough plywood for a full width section, so I'm doing it in two pieces. But since it's the underside of the shelf and you'll really never see it, I would appreciate you turning a blind eye to it. 
Okay, so two other methods to create this floating shelf look if all these miters scare you is to laminate two pieces of three quarter inch ply together, take a piece of three quarter inch hardwood, edge band it all the way around. And if you don't want to waste that much plywood, you just take one sheet and put the edge banding around. Now, if you want an inch and a half, you make this inch and a half, two inches, you make it two, and it gives the illusion of a thicker shelf. The other method is to laminate two pieces of plywood together and then get some iron-on edge banding. This is just three quarter, but they sell it thicker, inch and a half, two inches wide, and then you can just iron-on edge band all the way around. That's a great method too. Now to add a little more support and just make sure that those pieces don't collapse on each other, I'm just putting a couple of wood shims, gluing and nailing those down before I put the final piece into place and clamp it home. Now with the floating cabinet and doors complete and the shelf now in the clamps, I could move on to the turned posts. Now this is going to be a bit of an experiment for me because what I want to do is use brass powder and epoxy to simulate the look of solid brass. Now you may ask, why not just solid brass? Well, if you saw my chisel handle video where I made about 20 chisel handles and integrated brass pins into all of them, I wanted to try something different. And after seeing my buddy Paul at Copper Pig Fine Woodworking and the amazing work that he has done using copper and brass powders with epoxy to simulate the look of those metals, I thought, hey, this is a cool idea. Let me give it a try. And I'll leave a link to Paul's Instagram in the description below. You gotta go follow him and check out the amazingly creative project that he comes up with he is such a craftsman and so creative and it's an absolute joy seeing all his projects come to life and meanwhile on the lathe something else is coming to life basically a turned walnut post and once I was turned down to rough diameter I used my parting tool to create three channels of decreasing size what I want to do is fill these with brass powder and epoxy to simulate three brass rings in succession and it turned out that was going to be a much more difficult task than I had expected, but more to that later. In the meantime, I cut down some more walnut blanks that will be used for the doorknobs on the front doors of the cabinet. I wanted to incorporate some brass powder and epoxy in those as well to kind of coordinate with the turned posts. So back to the lathe, turned it down to rough diameter, and then using a Forstner bit, I hollowed out a little bit of a well in the top, which will accept a nice pool of epoxy and brass powder. And then using a pencil, I kind of mapped out where I wanted my parting tool to go to hollow out a channel like on the turn posts. And all right, I made a few just in case I make some mistakes, which oh boy, did I. But back to those in a minute. In the meantime, I needed to make a frame for the mirror that goes above the floating shelf. So I ripped down and milled up some more walnut strips and then cut some miters on the corners over at the chop saw. Got it all laid out and then plunged for some dominoes. And then I could get everything glued up and using dominoes on these miters just really helps with alignment that way the miters don't move all around when you try to clamp them so I clamp them wipe off the excess and cheese then I needed to cut a rabbit in the back of the frame that would accept the mirror. Now you may ask, why didn't you do this before you glued up the mirror? And you can, but the reason I don't like to do that is if there's any misalignment within the thickness of the frame, you can sand that flush. If you cut the rabbit ahead of time, you can still sand it flush, but the inside of that rabbit may be misaligned. And then it's gonna look odd when you put the mirror on top of it. And then I clean up those round corners with a square chisel. And then it was time to apply some finish. I'm using Rubio Mono Coat in Walnut. My process is pretty simple. I spread it on, work the oil in really well with a white Scotch-Brite pad, let it sit for five or 10 minutes, and then using a microfiber cloth, I wipe off all the excess until it's dry to the touch. And at this point, I realized I totally forgot to build the little shelf for under the framed mirror. So I frantically grabbed some walnut and started working on that. Now, if you've never used this little tip before, if you use PVA glue and then mix in a little bit of CA glue, the CA glue will dry instantly. That way you don't have to clamp the joint. And then the PVA glue will continue to cure during normal business hours. And once that was all dry, I could rip it to final width plunge for a few dominoes, and then glue the frame to that shelf using several clamps scattered here, there, and everywhere. Now this is where my earlier days of being a skyscraper window washer really came in handy to get this mirror sparkly clean before assembling it into the frame. Now here's what happens when you really don't think things through ahead of time. So what I did was I cut some little walnut shims, 
just to center that mirror and keep it from moving around. And then I could put the back on and then just using these little glazing points, I pushed those into the sides and that kept the back in place. Uh, yep, yeah, that's a bevel edge mirror with a walnut frame and a walnut shelf. Okay, now on to the brass powder and epoxy. Now I'm not gonna show you all my failures here because there's just not enough time. But what I did is the brass powder just didn't have enough zip to it. So I'm adding a little bit of this gold maca powder, which is a totally different texture and density, but just adding a little bit, added a little extra pop. Now the first mistake I think I made was using the medium hardener instead of the slow hardener. It just seemed no matter what I did, I always got air bubbles with a medium hardener. The slow hardener would have allowed that epoxy to dry slower and allowing those air bubbles to come out. And a huge thank you to Total Boat for supplying all the epoxy I needed for all these wacky experiments. Now, Paul at Copper Pig Woodworking suggested a peanut butter-like consistency to make sure that there's enough brass powder suspended in the liquid. Now, as you can see, my first technique here was to fill the void and then wrap packing tape on it to keep everything in. So when that was dry, I could chuck it up in the lathe and start turning and see what lies beneath. This one actually turned out pretty nice. And once I had gotten rid of all that excess epoxy, I started to turn it down to my final shape, which was kind of conical. Now in my many experiments, what I found the best thing to do is actually rough this out to your rough shape first, then part your groove and then pour the epoxy. Now in this experiment, I did that and dipped it in a cup of epoxy upside down and let it sit overnight and it came out much better. Now the important thing when trying to get this brass powder and epoxy mixture to really shine up and look like brass, you have to go through the grit progression very carefully. Here was mine, 150, 220, 320, 400, 600, 1200, 1500, 2000, and then finally, 4 aught steel wool. Now this isn't perfect, there's definitely some imperfections, a few little bubbles, but it has a really nice shine to it and I think it looks like real brass. And then I could trim off the nub on this one. Now for those tiny little air bubbles, if you use CA glue and a mixture of the powder to fill them in, let that dry and then turn it down, that seemed to work, but not all the time. Now Paul at Copper Pig suggested actually pouring powder in the little air bubbles and then using thin CA glue, pour that over the powder Powder, which sucks it down into the hole and avoids any surface tension problems that I was having by trying to spread the mixture itself into the void. Now for these turn posts, I actually used a top from a spray paint can, cut the bottom off and wrapped it around the post, which created a nice little well for me to pour the epoxy in. And when that was dry, I could turn it on the lathe and <laughs> you gotta be careful on this one because plastic goes flying everywhere. But this process did seem to work and it turned down nicely. Had a few air bubbles in this one as well, but once I went through the grit progression and ending up with steel wool, this thing really shined up nice. So then I could cut that to its final length and then move on to finishing all these brass and walnut accoutrements. Now I'm using Osmo on this because it is the clearest oil wax finish that I have found, and it should help maintain the natural color of that brass. And to attach the knobs to the cabinet doors, I'm drilling for some threaded inserts here. And I use a couple drops of CA glue just to make sure those stay in place. And then it was time to get everything hung up on the wall. So I attached my French cleat into some studs, threw the cabinet on there, gave it a little bang bang to make sure it was level. Now to attach the framed mirror to the wall, the mirror actually came with these Z clips. So I just removed them and screwed them to the frame and the wall, check for level, looks pretty good. And then I could slide the mirror over that and lock it in place. I used a long level to make sure everything was in alignment. That looks good. Now, to be honest, I didn't really put any thought ahead of time into how I was going to hang this floating shelf from the wall. So once I figured it out, I put in some more walnut filler strips so I could drill those out that would accept these shelf supports. I could screw those to the wall, level, and then slide on that shelf. And then using a post, I could make sure that that was level in both directions. And I also made this little door stop that I needed to screw to the top of the cabinet that would, well, stop the doors. Now it's time to install the door knobs. I'll drill for some screws, turn those on nice and tight, and a soft close. All right, big boy, this is my outro, not yours. <laughs>
All right, so there you have it. Now you'll notice that I have two posts up there now, and the reason I didn't show you how I attach them because they're not attached. I had a lot of air bubble problems with this one, and every time I filled it and turned it down and filled it and turned it down, it kept getting smaller and smaller. So maybe on camera you can see that this is a much smaller diameter than that one. So I need to redo this one. Once I do that, I'll attach these, probably screw from underneath, and then stabilize this. I also wanna turn a couple of new knobs. These ones are just a little bit big and maybe even on camera you can see that this one is a little greener than this one. So the mix was off because I turned them at separate times. So probably something a little smaller like this, but I'll do that in my spare time. But all in all, I love the way it turned out. And I'm excited to do a little more experimentation with the brass powder and the epoxy to see if I can really dial this in and make these look even better than they do. So until next time, thanks for watching.